I would like to welcome to the stage our first speaker, Mari Vore, who is a psychological researcher at the Department of so uh, Social Psychology, where he studies psychological functioning in the context of digital technologies and online and virtual environments. Much of his most recent research has focused on the roles that digital technologies and particularly video games play in individuals' well-being. In his work, he applies statistical methods to large-scale data sets and conducts controlled experiments. He also places great emphasis on the transparency and reproducibility of all of his work. So please give him a round of applause and a warm welcome. Hey everyone. All right, let's get this uh, show on the road. Kaboom. Hey, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me today. It's very nice to see all of you here who are interested in all of our work and games and hopefully some science as well. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. So as mentioned, I'm a psychological scientist and recently I've been focusing on video games and what they can do for us. Particularly, I'm interested in uh, people's well-being in the context of video games. Basically, I want to know whether video games can be good for people, are they bad for people, um, and how we might support these uh, viewpoints. In my presentation, I'm going to uh, focus a little bit on the methodologies that uh, psychological researchers have used and are using in this field of study to give you an idea of how we're trying to understand how the things that you enjoy so much might be affecting your uh, lives and social circles. So to kick this off, um, there's a lot of hopes both uh, among society more broadly, but among uh, social researchers and psychological researchers as well, that video games can, ha can ha play a unique role in supporting people's well-being by uh, affording opportunities for social socializing, like in this picture where uh, these uh, young individuals are enjoying a classic LAN party kind of situation where they actually physically gather together to play games and drink Coke. Um, now you might more likely uh, to be in a situation where you're on Discord rather than in the same room when you're uh, socializing and playing with your games, but the idea is, same, is the same. Games, uh, can be a social glue that bring people together so that they can um, communicate with each other, just basically have fun with each other, um, engage in interesting tasks, uh, uh, feel a sense of accomplishment, maybe competition, disappointment sometimes. Uh, but these are all uh, functions or basic psychological needs that games can target, like socializing and feeling accomplishment. Um, on the other side of the psychological research spectrum on uh, video games are uh, psychologists and neuroscientists working on topics that have more to do with how we think, how our minds work, how uh, effective we are in processing information. So here's an image of a participant in uh, what is a fairly typical experiment where people are asked to play usually these kind of like fast-paced action games or strategy games and people are really trying to study whether these kinds of games in particular, but uh, all kinds of games more generally, um, affect specific uh, aspects of our brains or our brain minds, uh, particularly in the fields of things like attention, how well we're able to attend to different kinds of stimuli or things in our environment, our memory, so how well we're able to remember things, and other faculties of our uh, cognitive machinery. And there is some promising work in this area uh, that has shown that, for example, very sort of low-level human performance factors such as your actual visual perception, how accurately you're able to detect things in streams of visual stimuli, um, can be enhanced by uh, repeatedly engaging with uh, these fast-paced action games. But there is a ton of work that needs to be done there to uh, check that those results reproduce, for example. Um, attention is another thing. Um, there is a lot of worry in our society today that engaging with screens is doing something to our attention and now we can't even read a newspaper anymore. Not that anyone actually reads newspapers, but you just scroll them on your phone. 
Um, and there's been increasing worry that kids in particular are uh, more likely to develop uh, attention deficit uh, problems. So for example, ADHD, attention uh, deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is one of the disorders that involves people's uh, reduced ability to uh, pay sustained attention to things. And there are now things, uh, games like Endeavor RX here, that doctors can prescribe to kids whose parents or the kids themselves uh, report that they have attention problems. So this is in America, where this is an approved uh, treatment program. You go to a doctor and uh, maybe you go yourself or you go with your usually your child and you tell the doctor that my child is having a problem uh, attending to things and is hyperactive, etc. And the doctor then prescribes this game to this child as a treatment regime and the, uh, the child is asked to play it maybe a couple hours a week and then over time there, is, there are promising results with this particular game uh, in curing or treating uh, severe mental difficulties like ADHD. But again, these results need to be uh, carefully replicated and um, uh, studied in more detail before we can say that games cure ADHD. It's a little bit early for that. Uh, on the other side, then um, among gamers, perhaps a little bit less, but at society at large, there have been historically worries that video games, particularly uh, extremely realistic and violent games like Doom, uh, <laughs> cause people to exhibit uh, aggressive and violent behavior out there in the so-called real world, right? So in the 90s, for example, when uh, some of these high-profile, terrible school shooting um, uh, school shootings happened in the US. Um, reporters were quick to find that some of these perpetrators of these horrible acts had been playing Doom in their spare time. And it then didn't take very long for them to suggest, oh, well, maybe if these people were playing Doom and they were also like actually murdering people, let's connect the dots. And there was again one of these moral panics where people, where people were very worried that violence in games and games that enable you to exhibit and explore violent behaviors and to see violence happening uh, makes violence generalize such that you walk out of your bedroom or wherever you're playing and you kick some butt. And that's basically the idea of, the, um, of some of these theories how video games affect violent behavior. And this is still an ongoing issue and there are two sides of researchers. One side of researchers say there is a conclusive evidence and a consensus among, among researchers that violent video games cause violence. And then there's the other side who says, no, there's no consensus and they probably don't cause violence. So who knows? Um, more research needs to be done, but this is uh, to many gamers a bit of an odd statement to say that uh, playing Doom makes you stab people. More recently, people uh, and international health organizations have been focusing on video game addiction. This is now um, in the process of being codified in these international uh, diagnosis guidelines like the ICD and uh, the DSM in the States um, as online gaming addiction. It has a few different names. And basically, it is a constellation of symptoms that some people suggest define a specific mental uh, problem or um, maladaptive pattern of behavior whereby people are so engaged with games that they can't let go. So they are uh, playing so much that they don't socialize anymore. They play so much that they don't go to work or to school. They don't do their homework, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they can't disengage with this behavior. And people are very worried about this. Um, and there's again two camps of researchers, one suggesting there is conclusive evidence to show that this is a real thing that we should be very worried about and up to 50% of young individuals are suffering from one form or another of uh, gaming addiction. And then there's the other side who says, hold on, we don't really have the evidence and we should maybe look into this in more detail before we restrict the basic human rights of children and young individuals to have a good time. Um, with this uh, addiction, the proposed addiction, there are now clinics uh, in the world where you can sign up to yourself or um, recommend that your child goes either to an inpatient or outpatient program to get, to get treatment for gaming addiction specifically. 
how do we know about these things? Next, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the uh, kinds of research methods that we as uh, psychological scientists have been using in studying these phenomena. So let's take video game violence and real world vi violence and this hypothetical link. In typical experiments, what you do is you ask a group of people to come into your uh, laboratory and then you ask them, could you play uh, this violent video game for half an hour? Then you take another group of people and you ask them to play this non-violent game for half an hour. Now you've manipulated exposure to violent video games. You need to find a measure of aggression or violence and you can't give people a knife and ask them to go run around. This is a very tricky thing to measure. Psychologists figured out that what you can do is use chili sauce. So in this task, which is called the hot sauce paradigm or the chili sauce paradigm, is you ask these people to go play one of these video games. Then they come out of the room where they were playing and you tell them, OK, uh, we have another participant in, a, in the other room and we're going to offer them some lunch afterwards. Uh, they really don't like spicy food. They really don't like spicy food. We would like you to put some chili sauce on their lunch. This is a hypothetical thing. They're not actually giving uh, chili sauce to the other participant. But they make the uh, player believe that they are giving chili sauce to the other participant. And they sprinkle chili sauce on the hypothetical lunch. And what you find repeatedly over and over and over and over again is that people in the violent video game condition here and here uh, put about double the amount of chili sauce on the lunch than players in the non-aggressive game conditions. People have done these sorts of uh, what are called meta-analyses, which are studies of studies. In this particular uh, study, they looked at 79 experiments. Not all of them were chili sauce experiments, by the way, but similar kinds of methodologies. And they find that if there was nothing going on, it would be extremely, extremely unlikely that you would see these kinds of differences. So it must be the case that violent video games make people express violent behavior, such as putting more chili sauce on uh, people's lunch who don't like, who don't like spicy food. Okay, let's now step back a little bit. Um, here's a picture of the cover of Pete Etchell's book. He is a British researcher who studies video games. He has a book out, I believe this was out in 2017, so it's rather new, called uh, Lost in a Good Game. And here's a quote from his book that describes his journey in video games and also psychological research about video games. And he says, after talking to players and video game developers, it made me realize just how immature some of the science we're doing is. We're asking the wrong questions in the wrong way, using the wrong methods. So there's a lot to improve. And next, if I have time, I'm going to run you through um, some of my own work, which I hope is a little bit better. So this is a bit, little bit of... Uh, self-aggrandizing uh, advertisement here, but I'm going to try to highlight to you some new avenues that people have been exploring in video game research. Um, this work has been done in collaboration with Professor Andy uh, Shubilsky at the University of Oxford, uh, Dr. Nicholas Johannes at the University of Oxford, um, Dr. Christopher Magnusson at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, and James Butlin, who is a Unity developer at Future Lab, uh, a British game developer and in collaboration with these other international companies, some of which you might recognize. So we've realized that um, there might be something to studying video game play as it happens. Not inviting people to your laboratory and asking them to play a game, but measuring people when they're at home, eating chips and playing games with one hand. Uh, so we're trying to measure video game play as it happens naturally, and then correlate that with various, various uh, life outcomes in such a way that we might be able to infer something ultimately about causal relations between those variables. I'm gonna skip that. Um, here's the very first study that we did. In this study, we worked with Electronic Arts and Nintendo to recruit players of um, <laughs> Plants vs. Zombies, Battle for Neighborville, that's an EA game, and Animal Crossing New Horizons. Uh, this was a couple of years ago, sort of at the height of the uh, early COVID pandemic, when especially Animal Crossing was really going through the roof in popularity. Uh, where we recruited thousands of players of these games, 
and spoke with, the, with representatives of these companies and convinced them, them that it would be a good idea for them to enable these players to give their play data to us. We know that companies, online platforms, log everything that we do online. You click on things, you play games, this, this data is recorded in data warehouses somewhere in the Arizona desert. Uh, it's usually used in this context to try to make the games better, but also to monetize uh, their products better. Uh, so what we wanted to do is to use that data for the common good to better understand how video games might be impacting people's psychological well-being. And in this first study, we call it a pilot study, we had thousands of people who played these games also answer questions about their well-being. And here on this graph on the x-axis is just the hours of, play, uh, hours of time, the time that they spent playing these video games in a two-week period. And then on the y-axis are their responses to a questionnaire about psychological well-being that um, relates to things like mood. How are you feeling today or in these past two weeks? And what we found in these two games was an extremely tiny, smallest possible correlation that you can detect, a positive correlation, such that people who, report, people who played more of these two games uh, reported slightly greater um, affective well-being, just a tiny bit um, greater affective well-being. So this doesn't tell you anything about causality, it just tells you that people who play more report slightly greater well-being. We then took this idea a little bit further and worked with more companies um, and, and games. So this particular study involved players of Animal Crossing, Apex Legends, EVE Online. Does anyone know what EVE Online is? Oh, amazing. Um, Forza Horizon, GT Sport, Outriders, and The Crew 2. So these are fairly popular titles. We again recruited tens of thousands of players of these games, so in total. Um, and then we followed these people over a six-week uh, time period. We again asked these companies to enable these players to give their data to us so that we can study it for what we hope are scientific purposes. Uh, then we asked these players at three time points in that six-week uh, period to tell us about how they've been feeling. What's your mood? How do you feel about your life? And then we did some structural equation modeling, which is a fancy word for doing correlations, and looking at, over time, how video game play within a person predicts their subsequent well-being. And what we find is that it doesn't predict well-being. Compared to how much you usually play, um, it doesn't matter if you play more or less in terms of your well-being. People just feel how they feel, and video games don't seem to play a role in that, um, at least as far as uh, the duration of gameplay is concerned. But we then dug deeper and we looked at people's internal uh, intrinsic motivations to play. So this is things like reporting that you play because you want to, because it gives you maybe a sense of autonomy, a sense of accomplishment, and so forth. So these are sort of good reasons to be playing, motivations to be playing. And we find that reports of intrinsic motivation predict greater well-being. So this suggests that the quality of play, so if you're playing for reasons related to intrinsic motivation, uh, you are, uh, that predicts your, your well-being positively. The contrary also holds. We asked for people for their extrinsic reasons or motivations to play, and these are things like you're playing because you feel like your social group is playing and you have to join them in the game to be able to socialize, or you feel some kind of external pressures to play. And the more you feel like that when you're playing, the lower your well-being ends up being. I'm going to skip this. We basically found no relation uh, between violence uh, in game and people's aggressive thoughts. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip some things. Do I have time to show a video? Yes, because this video is awesome. Trust me. All right, 
This is a video of our latest uh, project that's going to be the first paper on this project is going to be published next week. Uh, in this project, we collaborated with the uh, Future Lab. Uh, James Butlin was hired to work at uh, Future Lab to make modifications into this commercially available product such that we can use it as a scientific instrument to study people's well-being and other psychological indicators during gameplay. Here a person starts power wash simulator and the game asks, how are you feeling right now? And it has the uh, university logo and it says researcher edition so people know that they're in a research version of this game. They start, uh, they continue their career mode. So this game is all about power washing. It's super sweet. So they start washing the car in this level. There's all kinds of different nozzles and stuff you can use. Very relaxing. So our participants went to Steam and saw that there is a research edition available and they downloaded it and started playing. And in the game, you get these kinds of messages, another question coming your way, and then it asks you a question about your psychological states like focus, enjoyment, well-being, and so forth. And when you participate, you get new skins and new nozzles and stuff, so we reward you with in-game uh, uh, items. You can also use the menu to report your mood outside of those automatic uh, pop-ups that happen in-game. And this is the first time ever that anyone has studied these kinds of psychological instrument inside a game. And it's much more plausible that if video games impact how you feel, your psychological states, we should be able to detect those in-game, not say two weeks later when we ask you, how were you two weeks ago when you played a game? So this, I'm super excited about this methodology because it allows us to look at um, people's psychological experiences in-game. Here's just a graph of one of our approximately 10,000 players who answered a couple dozen survey questions in one day. This is one day on the x-axis. Uh, in total, we have uh, so far about 700,000 responses in-game from these players. This uh, particular person asked, answered three different kinds of questions during a, a day related to their well-being, focus, and enjoyment during play. And what you can just see for this one person during one day, perhaps some kind of fluctuations in their enjoyment where they started feeling super good, maybe dipped a little bit, and then towards the end of the night uh, felt even better. Maybe focus went up and down, maybe. Uh, I'm not showing any statistics here. This is purely just me kind of. Uh, uh, presenting these data here. Uh, and well-being, maybe in early in the morning, they were f feeling slightly less good than later on in the day when you saw a kind of a plateau happening. And this player on this day was pretty like, pretty into power wash because you can see that they're just reporting stuff all the, all the time. They had lunch here at uh, around noon and then um, like a super quick dinner here, right? And back to power wash. So we really followed their like psychological states the whole day for this particular day, for this particular person. And um, this, we hope, is going to bring, uh, shed new light into not only like how much you play, but um, what happens during play and your behaviors during play, how those might predict well-being. Because in addition to these responses, we now sort of took the role of these mega companies that collects all of your behavior because everything this individual did in the game and everything that happened in the, in the game uh, flew right into our database. So in addition to their psychological reports, we can, we can find out everything that they did in this game. And this, I have not yet analyzed this data. Like I said, this is just about to end this study. So stay tuned. This is gonna be super cool. If you have time, play some Power Wash Simulator. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to toot this stuff when it's done so you can follow me on uh, Mastodon. So hopefully I gave you sort of a bird's eye view of what's been happening in uh, the psychological sciences related to video games, uh, but also a glimpse of uh, what I've been doing because that's what I like talking about the most. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Mati, for these very interesting insights. Our next speaker will be Aris. He is the coordinator of the Game Art and Animation Program at the SAE Institute in Amsterdam. And he's also the head of the Games Department. He has a PhD in Cultural Analysis at the University of Amsterdam, and he's focusing on the interplay between fan communities and the gaming industry. He is also a guest researcher at the University of Amsterdam. He has been following the industry for over 25 years and has worked as a video game journalist. He will now help us uh, form a clearer picture of the impacts that video games can have on representation. So everyone give a small welcome round of applause. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, lovely introduction. Uh, also, thank you to uh, Link for having me here. Uh, once again, I really enjoy these events and I'm very happy to be here. Also, thank you for uh, being in attendance. Today, uh, I come to you with a double identity. Um, as uh, it was just explained to you, I uh, work um, at the SAE Institute of Amsterdam. So um, we do uh, some creative uh, media work there. And I'm also a guest researcher uh, focusing on at the University of Amsterdam, focusing on the intersection of uh, online communities of uh, gaming and uh, the industry. Uh, therefore, uh, for this presentation, I'm going to include a little bit of uh, industry, gaming industry knowledge and uh, some cultural analysis and uh, mix them together for a um, bigger result. Let's start then. Uh, can I press the correct button? Yeah, so uh, this gentleman right here is uh, William Caxton, or was William Caxton. Um, in uh, 1476, uh, he published a book titled The Game and Play of the Chess. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly because my uh, old English is not very good, but it was quite an old book. And uh, for a long time, it was thought to be the first book to be printed in the English language. In this book, uh, Caxton uh, presents uh, members of the British society of the time as uh, chess pieces and uh, assigns attributes to each piece uh, based on what they do on the game and uh, finds analogies in the uh, British uh, society of the time. Following on that uh, Caxtonian analogy, um, I have also found that there are some, uh, let's say, <laughs> similarities uh, in uh, a bigger um, chess game that is being played in uh, an area much bigger than uh, the UK, namely the entire world. And uh, some people have bigger um, powers, some people are just pawns, but not always realize it. Uh, I'll, I'll promi I promise I'll make it a bit clearer now. So. Before we get there and start talking about uh, pawns and uh, power in the board, let's talk a little bit about culture. What is culture? I mean, you can have uh, multiple definitions of what culture is, but one definition I really like, and I think it's quite applicable here, is one by Dick Hepike that says that uh, culture um, consists of various elements of everyday practice, including activities, behaviors, and meanings. Okay, so if we accept this definition, then it uh, makes sense to look uh, what affect those um, practices, activities, behaviors, and meanings. Before we get there, also important to keep in mind that in every type of culture, there is hegemony or hierarchy, struggle, and this brings fraction in uh, cultures, subcultures, meaning cultures within cultures, communities within other communities, and of course, resistance. And by resistance, Sometimes uh, we mean opposition to meanings. Uh, for example, as Janice Radway found in uh, 1984, uh, reader, novel readers uh, would make their own meanings and sometimes uh, come up with their own um, ideas, their own scenarios that would oppose the official um, uh, plot of, of a book, aka fan fiction, as uh, we would label it a few years later. Uh, similarly, Henry Jenkins, a few years later, used uh, the term poaching by Michel de Certeau to um, make it textual poaching. And uh, we refer to fans, people uh, who follow the popular culture, cultural um, realm, 
when they create their own meanings, their, when they create fan art, when they create their own songs their, or their own content as textual poachers. So some people participate in uh, those fan cultures through resistance. And by resistance, again, I don't mean going out on the streets and rioting, even though that happens as well. Uh, I mean uh, participating by creating their own alternative meanings. Now, this brings to participatory culture. In 2006, the Time magazine named you as a person of the year. Yes, you. Because users would create their own content and distribute it online through platforms. Meaning that if any of you, and I see a lot of young people in the audience, were active on the internet around 2006, that means that congratulations, you are Time, of the, Time magazine's person of the year for 2006. You can add that to your CV. I have uh, added it actually on my uh, Twitter bio. It's true. And uh, to quote Henry Jenkins again, uh, the reason for that happening is now because people uh, or, or the society in general act both as consumers and contributors of meaning and further shape uh, content. Sounds nice, right? Sounds quite empowering. We'll get to that in a moment. The, this is just some platforms, uh, a list of platforms we, we use to um, participate nowadays, of course uh, used uh, primarily in gaming as well. Now actually game man manufacturers, game designers encourage people to share content online, encourage people to shape um, the, the gaming community they're part of. For example, here we see the share button on the PlayStation 4. I would have included the PlayStation 5 uh, controller, but I think the share button is not very uh, visible on that. so. I chose to go with a PS4. If you uh, type uh, the title of a game, you will find a myriad of uh, reaction trailers, uh, of actually videos, reaction videos to trailers. You will find uh, discussions. You will find all sorts of um, reviewing, which comes from users themselves, players themselves, not uh, um, journalists or not the people of the industry, but uh, the, the people that these uh, products are being addressed to. Then we have Twitch, which uh, was the, is, still is uh, the major platform of um, content distribution that stems from players themselves. And then there are pages on social media used by companies that uh, they employ to get in touch with their fans and um, sometimes help shape the content together. I'll also get to that in a moment. We have Twitter and uh, we also have a story, one of my favorite stories. I'm going to uh, throw a few examples here so we will reach a general consensus later, but uh, I would like to share a few stories first about Mass Effect 3. Uh, has anyone played Mass Effect? and Mass Effect 3. Okay, were you happy by how it ended? Yeah, I see someone giving me thumbs down there. Yes, uh, many people shared that sentiment. Therefore, they created um, extended cut of uh, Mass Effect 3, which was a free to download um, patch to the game. And it changed the ending because exactly many people went online all the, on the social media that I sold earlier and um, complained about how the game ended. So they got a free um, improvement. I don't know if it was improvement or not to the, to the game's ending. Similarly, uh, when Star Wars Battlefront 2 uh, came out a few years ago, many people complained about the use of loot boxes in the game and how the game didn't really live up to the standards they had uh, for a particular game. So uh, temporarily, um, EA had to uh, pause the um, sale uh, of uh, loot boxes and try to find a different way to satisfy players. So here we have another example of uh, players uh, making their voice heard and changing the uh, the game of the game. <laughs> um, also a very important uh, category to keep in mind is modification. And uh, here we have uh, player known as Battleground or PUBG, which started as a, no, no, we're not there yet. Which started as a modification. And uh, then Brendan Green, or also known as player unknown, um, got um, in, 
touch with uh, first, I think it was uh, Shoni who found his um, modification work online and later uh, he had also get come in touch with some people in a Korean studio and got uh, funding to make his uh, vision a reality and create uh, PUBG, which was, uh, which is, uh, last time I checked, uh, the fifth best-selling game of all time, which started out of a game modification of just a very aspiring um, modder. And of course, modification is quite tied to the video game uh, industry because uh, we have uh, uh, Counter-Strike, which again started as a fan-made endeavor and later became an, an official game, Counter-Strike Global Offensive, uh, which is also one of the most played games of uh, this current era and uh, has its roots to grassroots culture, mod culture and uh, fan culture. All this, uh, Apply, uh, all this is, can be encapsulate, encapsulated by what Axel Brun said back in 2008, that uh, now um, consumers act as producers. Users are now uh, appropriate content, they assimilate it, they recreate it, and they send it out. So they are both users and producer at the same time, which makes them producers. Sounds fancy, right? Yeah, sounds great. All these sound great, and as I said earlier, very empowering and um, very hopeful. But uh, is it like this? Should it be maybe making us a bit suspicious of uh, how the industry works? Namely, are there any traces of exploitation there? Well, we live in a capitalist society, so my answer uh, in brief is yes. But let's have a better look. Now, um, this is a screenshot from the uh, Twitter page of Mortal Kombat Mobile, a uh, mobile application, mobile game, based on the popular series Mortal Kombat, in which um, the creators are asking, and I like the wording here, help us plan the rest of the year. So they're pretty much asking the fans themselves to go online and vote for their favorite character to be implemented in the game. For some people, that sounds great. Yes, I get the opportunity to let the creators know what they should do for me. I can also call it free uh, marketing, free marketing research, um, because it is. <laughs> um, going back to uh, an example, uh, Fallout 3, anyone interested in the Fallout series here? Oh, I see a lot of people. Have you played Fallout 3? And were you excited when Fallout 3 was announced? Yes, you were. And many people agreed with you as well. The thing is that when Bethesda acquired the rights for Fallout 3, they opened up a forum and they said, please w let us know what you want to see implemented in the game. So lots of fans went online and they started designing characters, they started designing items, stages, all sorts of stuff, because uh, they wanted to get the game that they wanted. <laughs> um, that didn't sit very well with some fans though, and uh, some actually complained about uh, the company asking them to do unpaid labor. However, what I found very interesting here is that uh, most of the fans quickly disregarded those uh, accusations and uh, saw it as an opportunity to get the game that they always wanted and get a very good game because there was a re very uh, big pause between Fallout 2 and Fallout 3 and uh, fans were getting desperate about the game they were going to get. So. Most of the uh, fans, the biggest part of the fan base, were, were actually quite uh, positive about uh, Bethesda asking them for their uh, opinion. So, as I note here, fans uh, don't always see themselves as carrying out labor. What they see is offering back to the community, being heard, and getting sometimes exposure uh, as, uh, if, if they make something really cool and the com company shares its own uh, online. Uh, they see it as a, an exposure, as an, an opportunity for them to climb the hierarchy of um, the, uh, the fan culture they're part of. But what is important for fans is to always get credit. Uh, for example, at some point, uh, speaking of PUBG, uh, when uh, Microsoft uh, used a poster that the fan made to uh, promote PUBG, and they didn't give any credit to the, uh, to the fan, um, the people who were responsible for that, the marketing team of Microsoft, uh, received a lot of um, harsh criticism on, uh, on social media and they took the poster down immediately. I, and this goes quite 
back, actually. I have a walkthrough here from the early mid-90s that I found online for the very first Tekken game. And there is this um, user here who complains about uh, finding rip-off variations of his uh, walkthrough, of their walkthrough, actually. Uh, sorry, the gender of this particular individual is not revealed. Um, um, complaining about uh, a rip-off variation of the walkthrough. And uh, also, at some different point of the walkthrough, actually says that, hey, if you have more information about the game, please get in touch with me so we make a better um, walkthrough together. So the user here does not care about getting any uh, financial um, compensation, only wants to improve the community and at the same time bash the people who uh, steal the work of the, um, steal well, borrow or get inspired by the work of uh, the players. Speaking of which, uh, going back to Bethesda, um, some of you might remember when they announced the Creation Club, which was uh, an initiative to offer fans the opportunity to create their own mods and then share them online on Steam. And uh, this mod would be up for sale. And this is a big no, no, no in uh, modding community because mods game uh, user generated content in general but mods especially are based on a gift economy meaning that people uh, created cre creating them as an exchange for anything but uh, money online so mods are being based in this uh, idea of creating stuff for the community's sake and offering it uh, for free or offering it uh, as an open source idea for other uh, fans to uh, improve and this didn't go very well uh, for Bethesda. Uh, then we have some other um, negative implications that happen in uh, gaming industries. For example, this is the Floss Dance Kid. Uh, he became quite uh, popular doing this dance, which was also implemented in Fortnite without the Floss Dance Kid's uh, consent. And last time I checked, uh, he was engulfed in a legal battle with um, uh, Epic. So I'm, I don't know how this went, but uh, this is another example of a company uh, acting a bit more uh, freely and uh, appropriating things that uh, people post online. Staying on the legal issues, uh, this is Project M. Is anyone familiar with Project M? Oh, lovely. Um, yes, so for those of you who don't know uh, Project M, it's a modification based on Super Smash Brothers Brawl because when it came out, some uh, fans found it lacking. So a few years later, they created their own modification, adding the features they thought missing. And uh, well, as I said, as I saw earlier, some modifications were positively received by the companies and the companies uh, hired the people, for example, or gave them some funding to create their own game, which is cool. As I said, as long as you get credits, as long as you get some something back, it's great. But uh, the uh, response here was uh, for Nintendo to ban it from tournaments, ban everyone who would mention Project M on the official Nintendo forums and create uh, Project M as a taboo expression in the competitive scene of uh, Super Smash Brothers. So also keep in mind when you engage into distribution, creation and distribution of um, user generated content uh, online, uh, there's also the legal aspect to, to keep in mind. There's actually this very nice meme uh, going online that any video game company, oh, this is a really cool mod, come work for us. Nintendo, oh, this is a really cool mod, see you at court. <laughs> so what can fans earn from this whole um, process? They can get a sense of belonging. They are part of an imagined community, as Benedict Anderson said, a community that is not limited by physical bounds. And uh, anyone can belong uh, as long as they uh, share the same uh, language, with, in quotation marks, the fandom language. They also get the opportunity, and this is uh, pretty important for some people, to express their creativity and connect with other people. So, as I said, some get recognition and they also get the opportunity to uh, make the transition to professionalism. 
Uh, one last thing though, and uh, something to also keep in mind. I made a reference to the legal part earlier, but now uh, this is something even bigger. This is something that concerns many fans and not just one particular person or a group of fans. As when Epic Games was uh, removed, uh, no, sorry, Epic Games, Fortnite from Epic Games was removed uh, from uh, the Google uh, Play Store. Uh, what uh, Epic did uh, was uh, to ask uh, the fans to create um, hashtags and create uh, merchandise uh, like t-shirts or posters or any other uh, items they wanted with the hashtag uh, I think save Fortnite and uh, actually create an entire campaign that would raise awareness to their uh, legal battle against uh, Google. So um, in a way they asked the fans to fight their own fight. Of course they had their own uh, legal uh, department and they would go into um, their uh, whole legal procedure against Google themselves, but they also asked fans to give them support instead of fans uh, doing this um, in their own um, in their own free will. They asked, "Hey, please, could you support us? Could you give us some moral support?" And uh, what seems as uh, <laughs> they made it seem like a David versus Goliath battle, like David being uh, Epic Games going against the Goliath of uh, Google which in a way makes sense, but uh, there were more layers to that than just uh, a company being uh, mistreated by uh, Colossus. It was way more than that. So what do we learn from uh, taking all this uh, into consideration and uh, thinking of uh, how uh, the interplay between communities and um, fans uh, happen? Uh, sorry, communities and uh, the industry. So, video game fans use platforms to communicate and share their content. They are the Times uh, Person of the Year for 2006, and they uh, have uh, some power, yes. So do the companies, though. They also communicate, they also share the content, and they also find that content. Fans often resist to companies by creating their own meanings, by creating their own uh, fan art, modifications, sometimes resist to companies by uh, straight uh, resistance and by, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, some fans were not eager to offer their uh, ideas to Bethesda or to any other company. Some efforts of resistance are successful, but success uh, will be commodified. The industry will find a way to make a profit out of it because this is the world we live in and uh, offer back a false sense of empowerment to fans. Yes, fans have an empowerment, but unfortunately this empowerment is often dictated by the industry itself. Any surrender of power by the company, therefore, uh, and by the industry is done under condition, condition that will make sure that the fans are never more powerful than uh, the industry and than the company at question. But if we want to talk about resistance, resistance comes from within come from within the industry and not from the outside. Anyone know Celeste? Games? Oh yes, lovely. So Celeste is a platform game, quite difficult at some points, I dare say. I haven't finished it yet, um, I admit it, and it's been out for years. Um, but um, what it uh, came to be, uh, and this is a reading that ma mainly the community offered, is that uh, the main character of uh, Celeste is actually a trans person. And this whole game is their uh, journey uh, to understanding themselves and going through the uh, gender transition. So Celeste started as an indie game. Indie gaming is uh, quite a potent for that because it's it's still within the industry right uh, but it's not uh, uh, indie games are not uh, directed and um, supervised by bigger conglomerates and bigger companies so they still allow for some uh, creative liberty to the um, to the designers so celeste is a game that can also be read as a powerful um, message about um, queerness then we have All Our Asias by Milos Hantani, who uh, also describes the experience of being an Asian uh, person in the Western world. And then we have one of my favorite examples here, the developers of Disco Elysium thanking uh, Marx and Engels during their um, speech at the Game Awards. So, uh, yes, these examples happen. I'm pretty sure if you think about it, you can find more examples mainly coming from the indie games. 
So I think that in a world that uh, resistance uh, is very much dictated by the higher ups, sometimes resistance comes from within. I thank you for your attention. All right, well, thank you very much for that presentation. And of course, time flies when we're having fun. So we've already reached our third and last speaker, uh, Hendrik Engelbrecht. Uh, he's a lecturer and PhD candidate at Tilburg University. Uh, he started his career as a gamification designer and has been teaching game design for serious as well as entertainment games for the past five years. In his research, he's looking into the persuasive power of games as enabled by procedural re uh, rhetoric. His latest publication discusses the potential of player agency in, present, uh, in preventing risky drinking behavior in young adults. So please, once again, give him a warm round of applause and a warm welcome. Does this work? Yes, yes cool. Uh, this makes it sound a little bit like I'm going to talk about uh, my research, which I'm partly gonna, but very zoomed out. Um, first of all, thank you, Missing Link, for having me. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, a little plug, if you guys are interested, since we have a games course at Tilburg University, look out for your minors and choose play and game. Uh, we're making serious games, and it's a lot of fun. Um, what I want to talk about today, because we had the themes of culture, um, I want to talk, zoom in a little bit and talk about culture on an individual level. How do we transfer from a game to the person, him or herself? And we're going to do that through uh, procedural rhetoric. And I'm going to explain the term and highlight a little bit of what that term means and how through procedural rhetoric we actually can transfer attitudes, we can transfer behavior from game to person for the good, the bad, and sometimes also unfortunately or rather a lot of times for the morally questionable. So what we're going to do, first we're going to talk a little bit about what is procedural rhetoric so you know what I'm talking about. Then we're going to have some very small case studies. It's really only one slide per case study, but that highlights what, I'm, what I mean when I talk about the power of procedural rhetoric, because I do really believe that this is uh, a very interesting way to look at uh, games and analyze games for serious impact. Then procedural rhetoric in serious games, because we're using entertainment games first uh, to highlight it. And then lastly, misuse of procedural rhetoric uh, which I think will serve well a little bit also as a discussion starter because I'm always curious about opinions on that because I have an opinion and obviously this is going to be colored by that um, but you probably also have strong opinions on this. So what is procedural rhetoric? So traditional rhetoric, if you have ever, re ever um, read a book, right? Or if you have ever watched a movie, there's always a message. So rhetoric is the art of persuasion, right? We're trying to get a message across. If it's uh, 1984, it's about the oppressive government. Unfortunately, we have arrived there already. But um, if it's about uh, the big short, it's about uh, the evil bankers during the financial crisis, crisis. There is an underlying message that is going to be sent from the author to you, whether you want it or not. And the whether you want it or not part sometimes, uh, well, first we have a nice definition because we're academics. The art of effective and persuasive speaking or writing uh, especially the exploitation of figures of speech and other compositional techniques. Unfortunately, sometimes this also happens rather unintentionally. Any work of art has an expressive purpose. So this is a crap movie. It's really bad, um, like a lot of Adam Sandler movies. But at the same time, also, it uses a lot of stereotypes and exploits these for misogynistic reasons in order to make you laugh. Even though this arguably is probably not the authorial intent, of this work, of this expressive work of art, very big quotes, quotes um, it does arrive at the audience. And that can be a problem, as we're going to see later. So let's do procedural rhetoric, on the other hand. In games, we do have normal rhetoric. We have things like written speech. We have audiovisual rhetoric that communicates a message to some degree. The thing that we have additionally on top of that is interaction, because as a medium, games are interactive. And this is where procedural rhetoric comes in and what sets games apart uh, from normal rhetoric. So as Burgos defines it, and Burgos is kind of like the, the grandfather of uh, procedural rhetoric and who coined the term, is the art of persuasion through rule-based representations and interactions rather than the spoken word 
writing images or moving pictures. So rule-based persuasion, the idea really that the interactions that you have with the game through the mechanics and the dynamics that result from that tell you something about the state of the world or tell you something about an ideology or political persuasion. I see some puzzle faces. We're going to get to that and hopefully resolve those faces into, uh, into different ones. So uh, for that, I'm going to use my personal darling, and I, I always love to use that game because I absolutely adore it, The Beginner's Guide. And then we're also going to take Far Cry 2 because I think it's a really good example of a game that seems to be violent and seems to be your standard shooter, but really has a message that it wants to tell. Oh yeah, and then going back to the idea of the unintentional message, I think there is something to be said about a lot of other games that unintentionally portray a certain worldview, and we're going to come back to that. Similarly as Jack and Jill, Modern Warfare 2022, there are some questionable messages that might have been put unintentionally into the game, which we're going to look at later. So what is procedural rhetoric? If we're going to use this model here from Sicard, he's mainly using it to explain mechanics, but it's, it's very simple. You have the player, and the player has a set of actions. These sets of actions are restrained by the designer themselves. You decide what somebody can do. Then you have an effect within the game world based on that action, and then a feedback loop going back to the player. If we allow our player, for example, to be able to shoot civilians, because we have that as a possible action, and the effect within the game world is no repercussion, we're telling the player something about the state of the world. The problem is, as games get more and more analogous to real life, right? the more we're trying to go high fidelity, we can make these direct connections between games and the real world, which is also why the argument often comes in that, oh, people who play violent video games actually become more violent. As was already discussed in the beginning, it's not that simple. Uh, the process itself, there becomes something for expressive purpose. There's an argument that Bogus makes that even something like Tetris makes a procedural argument. And we don't have the time to go into that, but I love the idea that we can just have a procedure and through the procedure we actually can have an argument. So if, if later we want to discuss it, I would love to. Um, but um, if you take everything else away, you would still have a message. So I want to take the Beginner's Guide as a game by Davey Reedon, who also did The Stanley Parable, uh, Return of the Oprah Din. Um, this is one of his lesser known games, I think, because every time I bring it up, people know The Stanley Parable, but they don't know the other ones. Uh, they don't know the beginner's guide. In the beginner's guide, you're following the narrator who is trying to figure out what happened to his friend Coda. Now, Coda was a game developer and made games, and you, on the, his computer, you go through individual small game experiences that Coda made. And that kind of tells you the story of how Coda felt and what Coda went through. So a lot of these experiences are very dark. They're really depressing. It really gives you the feeling that Coda was in a very dark place when he made them. But then where we jump in is, at a certain point, we come to a house. We come to a house with a really bright interior. And we go inside and we have some very soothing music playing um, and we start looking around. And the only thing we can really do in this house is we find the bed and we can have an interaction of making the bed. And then we find the dishes and we can do the dishes. We can arrange the pillows that are in the bedroom. We can organize the shelves. And then we can start over, the bed is unmade, we make the bed. Then we clear the table again, we do the dishes, we arrange the pills, we organize the shelves. We go back, we make the bed, we clear the table, we do the dishes. We go over and over. And while this is happening, we have the narrator slowly coming in and talking about, he was grossly happy all the time. And nobody directly tells you what is happening, but he's making an argument about structure. He's making an argument about somebody who's suffering from depression, coming to realize that structure is the thing that he needs. And we're making that argument without using expressive language to tell me that. I figure it out because I go through the process that the designer designed for me in this case. And I think for me, this is one of the most, it's a very simple one, but I think it highlights really well how powerful procedural rhetoric as a tool can be. Far Cry 2. And uh, now a lot of you probably know the newer Far Cry games. Unfortunately, they've kind of left the station when it comes to procedural rhetoric. Um, so in Far Cry 2, um, that's released in 2008, yeah, uh, we have a war, a civil war in an African, unspecified African war-torn country between two factions. And I think what Far Cry 2 does very interestingly, it really shows you the ambivalence of morality. 
Whereas in a lot of other shooters, you would have a faction and you do missions for that faction in order to come out at the other end and resolve the conflict, Far Cry 2 makes you do missions for both factions and nothing gets resolved. Far Cry 2 intentionally constrains the actions that you have as a player and tries to frustrate you by having a malaria mechanic. You need to take malaria medication. Your weapons degrade, your weapons jam up, thereby stopping you in combat. There's nothing fun about this, but it overall paints a picture. We have humans as an expandable resource in war, whereas in other games, and newer Far Cry games as well, you go to an outpost and you clear the outpost in order to gain territory. Clearing outposts in Far Cry 2 doesn't do anything. Once you come back to the outpost later, the people are gonna be there again. The faceless humans that you have to kill again because it's the ambivalence of human life in a world that really doesn't, doesn't matter because we can't resolve this conflict. So the constraints established here in gameplay and the overall systems really paint a grueling view of war and conflict. We're showing that hyperviolence itself is an ineffective solution, it doesn't solve anything. Think about all the shooters that you're playing and all the games that have violence in them and think what picture they're painting about violence. Violence usually is the solution. Uh, a couple of notables, just because we don't have enough time. Papers, please, also really good when we're talking about uh, procedure rhetoric. The Stanley Parable and uh, also the remake now that came out. Spec Ops The Line, I think one of the most effective anti-war games that I've ever played, uh, even though the cover does not really tell that picture that looks more like a uh, cool shooty, shooty dude. Um, <laughs> just uh, if you wanted to check that out. Uh, so what about serious games? Now, serious games, this is a definition by Johansson. Uh, serious game is a simulation, which has the look and feel of a game, but it's actually a simulation of real world events and processes. And that's where we come back to the analogy uh, to procedure rhetoric. The idea is that we're trying to accurately portray how something feels in real life. It's about depression, it's not only about physical events and processes, it's also about mental events and processes. Um, yeah, so, so if you see it here, if, if we can accurately constrain the rule set, if we can accurately constrain the actions and the effects within the game world, including the feedback, we can model these specific rhetoric arguments that we're trying to make about real life. For example, spent which was a game uh, from 2011 developed by an ad agency, McKinney. Uh, it's trying to show you what it's like to have low income, to uh, struggle financially. And the idea here is that you start off with a budget and that budget does, for example, not allow you to, um, you find a job, but it does not allow you to move to the city center because it's too expensive. So you move outside the city center. What that then means for you is the problem is, well, you need to get a car now. Well, the car now needs to get insurance because otherwise it breaks down. Then from that point onward, well, you also need to get the kids to school, so they need bus money. So it shows you the cascading effects that we often oversee when we're actually talking about poverty because we ourselves cannot relate. Because on the face of it, you can say, well, why don't you get an apartment outside of the city? Well, it's not that easy. It's the cause and effect chain of events, of the processes that are going on in somebody's life that are being modeled in a procedural argument in this game to make you understand where somebody starts and where they end. So the accuracy of the process and effect is important because otherwise if we make a game about poverty and we basically just say, well, if you get an apartment outside the city and then it's being solved, then we really misappropriate and we're making the wrong statement, the false statement. The second part is that it's for a specific purpose and that purpose can be abused. We can use processes and events, we can misalign these processes and events to our own fault, to our own gain. So how can this go wrong and uh, arguably morally questionable? We communicate a worldview through the games we make. I hope you understand a little bit better what I mean with this now. But we can intentionally or unintentionally create a harmful message as well. If the accuracy of the process be it mental or physical, is either biased because we want it to be, or it is lacking because we didn't do it very well. So this is, um, I just want you to shortly watch this. This is from Call of Duty 20, Modern Warfare 2 2022. So this takes place in, um, in a mission where you are in an urban environment where people are normally working, they're, they're, they're normally living there. 
Uh, and you come in there and you're chasing the bad guy. And once you meet civilians and you have to go through the house, the civilians are like, what are you doing? Help, help, help. And the way that they chose to implement the de-escalation is to hold your gun into their face and de-escalate, is what the game is asking you to do. Now, what message does that send about police brutality, be about what somebody with a weapon who's in a part of the executive is allowed to do to you? Whether intentional or not, it does send a message. So we come to the last part of this, and this is about America's Army. Does everybody know America's Army? Does, who knows America's Army? I have a couple. So America's Army uh, was a video game released in the early 2000s, um, and it's a state-sponsored video game by the um, American Army. Um, it was funded, and I think this is an important point to make it, it was funded by the recruitment budget of the military. It had a teen age rating, so they dialed back the violence so they could give it a teen age rating, and it was free to play. Uh, it got shut down this year. Um, I'd some, sometimes I'd like to think I had something to do with it because I always preach about it for years, but unfortunately, probably not. Um, it has been discontinued in May 2022. But America's Army is part simulation. It's trying to simulate the life of an average soldier uh, in that you have rules of engagement. So the way that you're allowed to attack an enemy, you're not allowed to kill a deathly wounded enemy. You have to take them as a prisoner of war. It has realistic weapon handling that is very different from other shooters. It has a military command structure. You have to obey the commands that you're given. In that way, we have a pretty realistic snapshot of what it's like to be a soldier. But the top part that we don't have is a pretty big part. Being a soldier is very complex. What we don't have is lying in the sand for hours and hours trying to wait, waiting to get that kill shot. What we don't have is the mental anguish that comes with being a soldier, the brutality that you're faced with, the trauma that you're faced with, right? Mental and physical events and processes. On top of that, we have gamified systems where that communicate a moral imperative. The idea that your statistics, your player statistic as an American soldier, you are denoted as loyalty, duty, honor, integrity, courage. And they're tied to your in-game performance, but they're completely out of context. The enemy is a faceless enemy. The only thing we really know is that you're an American soldier, so whatever you do um, inspires loyalty, duty, honor, integrity, and courage. We're removing all context and making an argument about what the duties of the soldier are. As Bogus says, America's Army also shows that epistemic games bear a risk. Sometimes we may want to question the values or professional practices rather than assume those values blindly. The idea being that if we have a process that is so complex that it's really hard to simplify it while keeping the integrity alive, while keeping what makes the job that we're trying to model the job that it is and prepare people appropriately, maybe we should not touch that. And that's kind of what I want to leave you with. For one, I think the existence of violence in video games does not imply exploitation of violence for entertainment. Sometimes that violence, like with Spec Ops The Line, is used for an effect of persuasion about the opposite, about the dangers of, uh, about the, 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 give me a second, <laughs> about, about how, how, um, how violence is bad, to put it bluntly. Um, on the other hand, we have serious games, and in serious games, we have both things happening at the same time. On the one hand, unfortunately, in game studies, what we see a lot is that we don't really have well thought out procedural arguments, but we have an anti-alcoholism game where you throw a ball at some bottles and then that is supposed to make you drink less. What we need to do is we need to bottle the, we need to bottle, we need to <laughs> model the procedure of what it's like to become an alcoholic and how we get there for people to understand, to have empathy and to learn to not fall prey for the same thing. On the other hand, we also need to protect players from unintentional harm that is both in the entertainment space and the non-entertainment space. And lastly, what I don't see at all most of the time is a call for disclosure. There's a lot of money involved in, for example, the Call of Duty games that comes from the American military for good reason, because it's fun to be a soldier in these games and it's fun to enact violence, but there's very little reflection on what that experience is. And we've seen over many scandals that we had with No Russian, uh, for example, with Modern Warfare 2, if somebody remembers, um, or with the last year's, uh, the, the last Black Ops game, where this moral ambiguity um, is, is being 
shown to people who cannot really reflect on it that well yet. And I feel like there needs to be a call for disclosure sometimes. The same happens with Top Gun Maverick, if you've seen it. Awesome movie, largely financed by the American military, for good reason, because it's a recruitment tool. And then the, the question that I just want to throw out there, should something simply not be made into games? I feel very strongly about this. I do believe there are things that should not be gamified, again, because we can just simply not accurately represent that process. And it's, it, it's I wouldn't say immoral, but it, 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 it has a lot of issues <laughs> to, to, uh, to then do it. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming back. Uh, we're now going to start the Q&A session. So if you have a question for one of the speakers, could you please first state for who the question is and then state your question. Uh, we have Joachim in the back with the mic. So just raise your hand and I'll direct him to come to you for your question. Um, so yeah, who wants to be the brave one to ask the first question? <laughs> what a surprise. All right, Sparta, go for it. Uh, this is for you, Hendrik. Do you mind if I call you Hendrik or should I call you? Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know. Uh, do you think that there are certain games that don't have a rhetoric and they're just there for simply existing? Like, there are some games that don't have a plot, like Minecraft or something? I don't know. <laughs> well, so so there, there's an interest. So, so maybe I can explain this, what, what, what I was talking about with, with Tetris and Bogos saying, well, even Tetris by itself would make a procedural argument. There's criticism of the idea of procedural arguments in that it always requires subjective reflection. So the argument of, of Bogos as well, if we have to, I uh, hope I'm not misquoting here, I think Murray was involved in some point as well. Sorry, guys. Um, if you have something like Tetris, it could be an argument about American consumerism um, because you're stacking things most efficiently and trying to, you know, put everything into its boxes. But then the retort to that as well, that's a subjective interpretation. And you need that interpretation in order for there to be an argument. So now different people would make different arguments. So now if we take that, if we take that and really apply it to almost literally anything, we will always get an argument because there's going to be a reflection on it. So do I believe there's, I specifically took the, the Jill, what is it called? Jack, Jill, and Jill. Jack and Jill example, because it's a terrible movie. Um, <laughs> because it, it, the idea that we can completely remove authorial intent from something I think is a fantasy. So then we need to be careful about that. But so is there something that does not have any procedural argument whatsoever? I don't think so, no. I think everything has to some degree. In the case of Minecraft, I think it's a lot more about cooperation. It's about creation. Uh, it becomes a little bit more implicit than in my examples, but I think it's still there. I don't think you can completely remove it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, then uh, you can take back the mic. Who would like to have the second question? Oh, lots of hands raised at once. I think we'll just go in this order and then move down that way. Hi, uh, this is a question for Eris. Um, it's about, uh, so, per producers, as you call them. Um, so, in the current world that we live in, 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 in video games, I've noticed that um, when games are released, uh, in comparison to, like, in the early 2000s, they don't come with that map editor anymore, like they used to. And um, with some examples, like for instance, with Blizzard Entertainment and uh, the creation of Dota and like League of Legends, um, how like do we then navigate a world where, like uh, like you said, with free labor, how do we then navigate in the future where we've noticed that a lot of innovation actually comes from players creating things, but doesn't it then feel a little stifling when um, you know, big companies realize that there's a legality aspect to it, so they don't put effort into it. So do you have an idea for what the future might be like when it comes to the interrelationship between corporate and us, the producer, in creating something uh, that's new or and fresh when it comes to gaming? Oh, very interesting question. And uh, I like uh, trying to imagine the future. Um, first of all, uh, yes, some games might not have uh, 
map editor as you mentioned but what i've noticed is that more and more games have uh, character editors now so it makes it even more interesting that people can uh, model uh, characters and they have custom ca customization for characters many sports games have the create uh, superstar like basketball games or football games or even professional wrestling games give you the opportunity to create your own character and uh, there's actually servers and uh, people uh, in the developer team whose task is to maintain those servers and uh, try to enhance and encourage um, the players to um, share the said characters. Uh, actually, very recently, um, when Soul Calibur VI uh, was released, um, Bandai Namco did this contest and asked uh, the fans to please share your character creation with us and the best ones will get uh, will be shared on our uh, Twitter and our social media. So pretty much they asked people to uh, create characters send them to Bandai Namco for, uh, as I uh, <laughs> like to say, free uh, advertisement, free uh, marketing, and uh, they just got a shout out on uh, Twitter, which for some fans, uh, yeah, can be uh, empowering, but uh, for, I think it has bigger benefits for the company than the fans. So to answer your question, I see a future uh, not very different than what we have now. I see a future in when its uh, companies will try to tap even more to the, uh, opportunities and uh, offered by not just the games themselves and the platform that the game is released to, but also uh, trying to tap into the potential of uh, social media, trying to tap in the potential of um, online media to uh, get even more exposure for the games. Just uh, as I said earlier, uh, PS, uh, PS4 consoles have the share button, which allows you to share uh, screenshots on your social media. So I think now we're getting into, uh, and not we're getting, we are, and we're getting to an either, uh, we're getting there even more to a, an area, let's say, to an environment where uh, all sorts of media will converge to a bigger experience that in the end uh, will probably benefit the company more than the players. All right, thank you, Ben. I think we had a question, yeah. Cheers, thank you very much for all three of the talks. They were really fun. Um, I have a question for Hendrik, actually, on your very last point on the kind of... So what you had on the slide and what you said were two different things. So on the slide, it said there are some things that shouldn't be made into a game. And what you said was, there's a worry about gamification. And I worry that there's a conceptual difference between those two. So as a cheap example, think of like Brenda Roberts' game Train, right? Where she puts into a game, oh, you're the people who are running the trains to get people to the camps in the Holocaust. She's not gamified the Holocaust, but she's put it into a game. Um, do, do you see kind of what I'm after with the, the conceptual yeah. difference there? Yeah. And I worry that there the way you pitched it, sure, there's lots of things that we shouldn't gamify, but that's not the same as saying that there are things we shouldn't put into games. Do you think that's sensible no, or? Yeah, th th that's a very fair assessment. I think uh, without taking apart now gamification, serious games, like conceptual definitions, um, I think going back to the, the, the specific purpose, right? So if we think about this example, and there's also the counter example of somebody that there was unfortunately somebody who made the Holocaust simulator, right? Which was a thing. So now the content wise, it's the topic itself should not be taboo because we as an expressive medium should be able to deal with it either way. But at the same time, the purpose of the game itself is a very different one and how it's handled. So should some things, yeah, so, so you're right in that. I, I don't think any topic should be off topic. Any topic should be off topic, but what I think is the 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 purpose for which sometimes the purpose itself for me would put it in a category where I think, well, do we make games for military training? Maybe we should not gamify those. And there's a some things are just not fun. Some things should not be engaging because we're going too far away from the simulation of what this is supposed to be and how you're supposed to feel like. And on that note, I, I do think it's very interesting if we, sorry, I'm going to cut it short. <laughs> that if we, I, I think it's very interesting the, the um, what is it called again? I, I'm familiar with the game, the, the game you were talking about. Train. It's Train, yeah. Game. Train yeah. makes you feel bad. It makes you feel shit. Sorry. 
uh it, it, it's it's but not when you're playing yeah you're playing, no but it, it, really it creates fun. that point of reflection which i think for a lot of procedure retro games is, is very effective sometimes we also need to go away and in research we do that a lot as well things need to be engaging and that's why we do game no they don't need to be you can feel really bad because sometimes we need to make you feel bad because you're engaging in a process where you're supposed to learn something sorry thank you thank you for the question uh all right then right below we had another question um, I actually have a question from Maddie, uh, because I see in your presentation. Uh, uh, thank you for all those uh, nice presentations. Um, and uh, the question from Maddie is that I see you present quite different genres of uh, of games. And I wonder, for a lot of games, it ha actually gave people different feelings. For example, I don't think people play Car Wash has the same in, uh, intention or, or, or feeling if people choose to play Doom. Doom. So I wonder, is there any uh, statistical difference between different genres of how immersion people are or how, what's the effect on people? Thank you. Thank you for your question. <clears throat> so first of all, Power Wash Simulator definitely like lives above genre. It's so amazing. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the world's first first person power washer game i believe <laughs> um but yeah there is definitely a question to be asked about the qualities of the games um and how they might differ then in their effects on our well-being or our violent behavior uh, life satisfaction and such things uh, we have not really looked at that in detail partly because all we have are the games and um, genre itself is sort of ill-defined. A game can be uh, grouped into many different genres. Um, it can define genre. Uh, so we haven't done that kind of a content analysis. Uh, I didn't show you our uh, results in detail, but we did not find that there were particular differences in the relationship between um, how long people spend playing those games and then subsequent well-being between the seven different game or eight different games that we've looked at even though they span quite a wide range of what we might consider uh, genre like EVE Online for example is uh, I believe of the genre spreadsheets in space <laughs> and then you have uh, your sort of more uh, straightforward shooters uh, racing games their associations uh, uh, how long people play those games and how they feel after that. They were all very, very, very similar. A very small relationships, if any, but they were very similar. And I'm not, uh, at the moment, I can't recall a persuasive empirical argument um, that would suggest otherwise that there, are, there is, for example, a specific genre that makes people feel amazing. And then there's another genre following which people would feel terrible. I don't know, maybe this uh, Holocaust train genre <laughs> might belong into one of those categories. I've never heard of it before. It sounds interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's something that, <laughs> not, not in that sense, but like, <laughs> I'm curious about this game now. Um, there, there should be more work into the content of the games, but not also in the terms of genre. Uh, I, as a behavioral scientist, I'm interested in the kinds of things that people do in the games and how that might affect their subsequent uh, psychological states. And different games afford you to do different things. So maybe driving this terrible train, this behavior, this particular kind of behavioral affordance does something unique than uh, driving a train in another kind of game would. Um, in short, I don't know, good question. <laughs> Uh, all right, I think over there in that corner, we had another question. Multiple questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Um, the first one for Maddie. Um, you mentioned the game that is prescribed um, in the US for children with attention deficits. Um, what exactly is the content of the game? If you know, like what exactly is the curing aspect of it? I have actually not played it. Um, I don't know the content in detail, but the idea is that it's supposed to reinforce your sort of naturally occurring abilities of controlling your attention. 
I don't know what that entails in that game. I have not um, been persuaded enough to actually like play it. I don't even know if you can buy it um, or whether you have to get a prescription. It's like medical cannabis, but medical game. Yeah, a uh, good question. <laughs> I don't know. You could look it up. Thanks. And sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the second one from Henrik. Yeah. Um, I think you touched up on this already a little bit, um, but um, I guess kind of intuitively, like you'd assume that games that kind of make you like not really feel good, like um, also specifically with the one where you have debt or where you kind of live in like some kind of poverty, um, that people wouldn't really want to play those games because it just makes you feel really terrible. And so I guess kind of um, like that's, I guess, instinctively like maybe what you think. So um, my question is kind of like what exactly about those games that actually draws people in? Like curiosity or? There is actually a scientific term for that. It's called eudaimo eudaimonia. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce it. I only see it written out and I've been pronouncing it 15 different ways. Anyway, eudaimonia, uh, which has been studied quite a bit in film studies, actually. So it's the idea that we seek out congruent emotion. Like if we feel sad, we watch a sad movie a lot of times. Or if, if we if we feel like we don't want to think too much, we watch an action movie. Like we're not only driven by, we're not only motivated to engage with entertainment when that entertainment is fun and exciting, uh, but we also want to face our feelings and face our fears and, and engage with that. And I think the same applies here where um, games as a eudaimonic experience is, is not as widespread, unfortunately, because uh, I think it, it sells better if you have a product for the masses that is like, has doesn't have any sharp edges so that everybody can play it and everybody can enjoy it. Um, but stuff like the the games that I was playing before, I think, are, are perfect candidates for a eudaimonic experience that connects to you personally. And we seek out those experiences. We do with in the same way that we do with films. Thank you. Uh, all right, I think right next to yeah. <laughs> yes, um, I also have a question for Ma M Maddie. If I pronounced it correctly, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, my question is, what was your selection criteria for the game titles that you chose to analyze with your team? And yeah, what was the motivation behind it? And because I've noticed most of them were like AAA titles that were quite competitive, quite dynamic, quite um, fast paced. So there was no re not really much time to kind of reflect on your emotional states at the time, I assume, for most of most players. Yeah. Um... Selection of games and also the participants is a really critical issue here, right? Um, the ways in which this research ultimately happened uh, were sort of different than how you usually do research. I, as a psychological scientist, would define, I want to study people from North Brabant, and then you sample from there. Here, it was more, we need to study play at, as it happens naturally. This data exists and it's in a data warehouse somewhere owned by EA. We're going to go to EA and say, we want to study this play data. We would like to have a game that's popular, that real humans play, that's not some dusty uh, Tetris clone from 1994. Um, and we would have some ideas, we'd say, we want to do this. And they would say, no, we're a multi-billion international, uh, multi-billion dollar international company. We decide what game you get to study. Uh, in a nutshell, that was the selection criteria. Um, sometimes we would go back and forth, forth and say like, well, look, this game doesn't appear to be one that might be, let's say, psychologically interesting or provide uh, a persuasive argument in terms of maybe the player base is so low and we'd go back and forth a little bit and then end up with another game that they suggested ultimately. Uh, but really, they were calling the shots to some extent uh, in that case, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, but we were lucky to get things like Animal Crossing, which was a flagship product at its time. Um, and hopefully going forward, we'll have more choices and freedom in choosing those things. Yeah, interesting, and thank you uh, for the sad truth and honesty. <laughs> uh, all right, is there anyone else? Yes, right here in the front. Uh, in the front and then in the back again. <laughs> Making him do a small lap around the room. 
Um, a question for Hendrik. Um, yeah, you were talking about like the how um, the refic of the game impacts someone, right? The procedural refic. But how much is that actually dependent on like how willing someone is to see that refic? Because if I play games, I play like story-based games or whatever, but my roommate says, oh, that's boring, and he plays shooters, and all the shooter teaches me is that I can't see blood. So, like, how much is that refic dependent on how open someone is to actually see that refic and not just, like, play through a game and be done with it? Thanks for the question, first of all. Um, I don't know. So the, the, the problem the, the problem with procedural rhetoric as a, as a field of science is that there's not much work there, which is why I'm, I, I really like it. So I started doing, so I started doing it. The problem is we, a lot of the reference points that we have, we really need to take from other forms of media um, to the point where the, the question of counter arguing comes in, for example, in, in persuasive communication, the idea that there is personal dispositions that are different between people. Um, in terms of what you can persuade them with and how they're thinking about something. So what we're actually doing right now is we're trying to isolate what a procedural argument is. And then we're also trying to look into uh, counter arguing as one uh, potential moderator in that equation to see whether or not that differs per person. But I think you're right. As with anything, if you are not willing to process the arguments, you're not willing to engage with that and you think it's it's boring. I can see like with the beginner's cut, I think a lot of people would think it's it's a boring game. What, what is this about? Then I don't think you're going to get there. Yeah, it still very much depends on whether you want to engage with it. Unfortunately, in games as well as in, in movies, we see a lot, right? The big blockbusters are usually the ones with the least amount of meaning behind them because it sells. So I think there's a there's a big mass of people unfortunately who don't who don't want to be persuaded about anything yeah so i think there's to just as a little caveat i do think there is always a little bit of that going on even with the adam sandler movie i still think you're gonna get part of that message even if that message is as small as it's it's okay to make fun of somebody because they're short which is really what that movie does terrible movie um <laughs> uh, so so i do think that still comes across but yeah no, it, it does depend on the individual, I agree, I think. Uh, all right, we had in the back another question. Yes. Hi, again, I'm just gonna be really slavish and maybe ask two questions if I may. Um, this one is to, uh, is to Henrik. Um, so I was thinking about Call of Duty and the, the example you gave me. When I think of Call of Duty and procedural rhetoric, I think of press F to pay respects and how that that stops you in the game and you can't do anything but i also then think about the inconsistencies in the procedural rhetoric of the game so obviously you all you play a sort of a lunatic of a soldier because you can do whatever you want right um and with the example that you showed um you intimidate civilians but at the same time um if you kill a civilian the game ends and for instance, I think in one of the most recent Call of Duty, there's so many, I can't remember which one. Um, if you, I think you're raiding a, a house, if you shoot the baby, the game ends. If you shoot it again, it takes you back to the main menu. And it should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I, my question basically is, what do you think about, for instance, games like Call of Duty, where there is an obvious uh, um, kind of trivialization of life um kind of playing both sides if you will in with the use of procedural rhetoric i think there is a standard that we have come accustomed to that we are okay with and i think they're treading that line where yes if you shoot the baby we need to end the game because we have not got luckily we have not gone far enough to where we're like yeah that's cool right we 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 want to we are applying a normative standard i'm not i'm no anthropologist so i'm not sure there's probably fancy terms for that in science but um so i think they're doing what they have to do and then the glorification of what you're doing for entertainment's sake takes a precedent to everything else. So I think that's then where we, we start going into, if you see the difference between America's Army and the Call of Duty, right, we have zero rules of engagement. There's bad guys, shoot him. If he's on the ground, then you have a fancy execution. That's the thing, right? The, the, this is like, I'm, and I play Call of Duty, I play it, you know, I'm, I'm guilty, but 
the thing that really irked me and where for one of the few things where I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm okay with that is, is um, the finishing executions that you can earn as cosmetics. And those are super brutal. And like, I'm not, I, I don't, I'm okay with violence in video games usually, but that kind of irked me as, uh, I'm not sure if I want to have an even more gruesome execution as an expression of myself in that game. And I think it's a slippery slope there. So hopefully we don't reach the point at some point where we go from baby killing not okay to to no, that's also okay. And let's have an execution for that baby, right? You don't want <laughs> That's on camera now. <laughs> so <laughs> so it's it, it's it, I, I I think it's what what we find acceptable and to your point, at some point we should not find it acceptable, right? So no Russian is anybody is any, anybody familiar with the No Russian mission in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 22? So you were an insider as part of. Sorry if I take too much time. Saw me off. But the, you were taking. Um, you were an an undercover agent uh, inside the Russian. Some kind of Russian unit doesn't really matter, but a Russian terrorist organization. And then in one mission, they make you go into an airport and mow down civilians because you're undercover, right? And in that case, you can mow down civilians. And I've seen both sides of that argument being portrayed as to saying, well, there, this is actually to the opposite effect where we're trying to make the player feel bad about it. And the other argument was, which why back then this caused a lot of critique, is, well, you're trivializing the murder of people. You're making people play a terrorist. And I think there is a very thin line there. And it, then we come back to the interpretation. Well, does it really depend on who plays that game? Somebody could be like, oh yeah, that's cool. Whereas somebody else feels bad about it and actually reflects on it to where we have the intended purpose. Because sometimes we need to change perspectives to show the other side of, the, of, of conflict and things like that. I don't know where I'm going with this, but point being, <laughs> it's complicated. But thank you for the question. I hope I at least got, got somewhere with it. Yes, you did. <laughs> um, on my next question really quickly is to, is to Matty. Um, from a psychological perspective, I wanted to ask, why? what is our fascination with uh, mimicry games that are all based around blue-collar jobs? <laughs> so, my, myself, personally, it's, it's anecdotal, I love American Truck Simulator. <laughs> now, the issue is, would I love to drive a truck across the Midwest? Probably not. It's a stressful job. And same goes with power washing. Um, so I was wondering what the emotional response is, and if that's something that's been studied or not, as to why the we we love sort of the mundane aspects of a video game that is really just echoing life, but we're in real life. So why are we then playing life on a game? Look, that's an awesome question. I really wish I could say. I don't know, ask a psychologist. <laughs> but I'm literally a psychologist. <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, given that I have no idea, I will now proceed and answer your question. Um, as kids, we want to be things that we know about, like fire people and uh, doctors and stuff. Maybe. There just aren't simulators for jobs that don't exist or are too new, like AI prompt engineer. <laughs> or is that already a game? Um, let me conclude. Euro truck simulator, and apparently there is an American truck simulator. Hell yeah. I don't know. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I would like to uh, add my opinion uh, on what uh, makes us play those games, because uh, as you mentioned, these games, uh, some of these games actually uh, require people to keep doing the same things again and again, and this mundane uh, repetition. So I would say that it may be because in real life uh, we get quite stressed with our daily tasks and uh, for you know living in. Uh, environment we live in we have to be stressed with a lot and some stuff and sometimes we look for that gateway uh, out. actually this is what gaming does to many people so i think by just doing something mundane something that doesn't require a lot of thought process and a lot of uh, um, 
activity just uh, by pressing one button or just by uh, doing the same thing again and again it helps us unwind was, i was uh, recently reading um, a research paper about as the uh, author calls it in interpassivity not interactivity but interpassivity and in this um, paper the author says that people really enjoy watching let's play games not because they learn new tactics but because it helps them in a way get 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 away and resist in a way the the, the structure of uh, constant stress and constant uh, manual tasks so but just by doing something mundane mundane something that doesn't require a lot of effort in a way helps them resist the the, the stressful uh, environment they are part of so that's my estimation I think that's really interesting. Let me just let me just go with this a little bit as a total <laughs> as a total like non-expert. But why is it then the case that um, let's talk about power wash simulator, any washing simulator, people don't go and like oh, I'm going to relax, I'm going to do the dishes for four hours, but yet they're willing to go and uh, power wash for four hours, and it relaxes them reportedly. Um, and people go then on YouTube and they watch videos of people virtually uh, power washing cars and that is chill and it relaxes them. Like I'm behind your uh, argument, but I also find it mysterious because what, what it is, what is it then in the virtual environment that is so like captivating, but people have to be like on drugs to do dishes for four <laughs> hours. Um, and I wonder what the difference is. Uh, probably it's easier to do it virtually because uh, I think yeah, yeah uh, you saw about that, you saw that person earlier who played uh, the power wash simulator from like ten in the morning till ten in the evening, yeah, <laughs> very important. But I don't think the same person would uh, be willing to do that in an actual uh, you know car wash. Uh, so I think it is yeah, doing it virtually makes it easier and uh, yeah, sometimes. Uh, and I, I'm going to insert some uh, pers uh, personal um, experience here. Uh, sometimes when I, uh, I, I used to play a lot of Crash Bandicoot 3, a game that's very dear to me, and there's this stage in which uh, you have to uh, participate in a racing contest and uh, beat uh, the other racers. But uh, sometimes I would uh, voluntarily throw that match. I would uh, lose the match and just go very slow while um, enjoying the scenery of the of the racing uh, stage, uh, because it, it wasn't an actual race. It was a virtual race, so it was much easier to do, and uh, it would just help me unwind, just help me relax, just to observe the the digital environment I was part of. So I think that's 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 maybe a reason. All right. Great question. Thank you very much for that. Um, I do have to say we are running quite close on time, so only one or two more questions, please. Uh, I believe we had Felix and Joel still wanting to ask something. I have less of a question, more of an observation about what uh, was talked about just now, uh, and so far that these sort of job games uh, where you perform a menial task um, seem to be very popular. Uh, especially recently um, with like the power simulator with uh, I can't remember the name but some game where you disassemble uh, spaceships uh, for scraps um, uh, and numerous others and uh, I think I had a point <laughs> um, I, I I think it would just be fascinating to study why we like to have a, a even EVE Online, which is literally just spreadsheets in sp space, um, why we like to, for some reason, like to have a job as a hobby. It's on if it's green. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so now I'm also going to take a step. I think for me, what it is, is the, it's very tangible proce progress. Like with a lot of games, the problem is I don't really see where the end is and I don't really see how I'm getting there. With something like Power Wars, something that I've played a lot as well. Um, it's, I, I have a task that is not particularly, I know I'm not going to fail at it. I know I'm going to get there and I can see how I'm getting there with every little bit that I'm doing it. It's kind of like this low effort task that still requires a little bit of effort for me, but I know I'm not going to fail at this dungeon in Diablo. No, I'm going to get to the end. So I have very little stress. I think that's what relaxes me about that kind of game, to be honest, but that's also more anecdote than anything.
Also, what I have noticed is that a uh, big part of uh, the fan base of those games, uh, to speak uh, a little bit in a different language, do this for the lulz, you know, for, 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 for the memes and for the lols. And uh, yeah, as they say, they just uh, want to share memes online and uh, have uh, fun. They don't take those games seriously and they just want to be part of a bigger trend that you mentioned is uh, happening now. So, yes, some people might be playing to relax, some people have more serious uh, objectives, but I believe there is a bigger, uh, a big part of the fan base out there who does this because it's a trend and they want to have a laugh with their friends, which is cool, by the way. Uh, all right, then I believe, looking at the time, almost the last question over here. Yes, uh, for Mati, um, about the psychology of games, uh, how does the... Um, <laughs> When I think about like violence in games and how that affects real world, uh, how is there any look into how frustration in games would affect personal mood of a person? Because I feel personally, I feel like games that are frustrating are more likely to make me feel bad in the long term than games that you just like commit violence. Yeah, frustration definitely. There's there's work on that. There's um, what I believe to be some of the more sort of robust findings is manipulations of things like frustration with the controller or not having experience not having yet like learned how the joysticks work and stuff like that and if you find that exper experience frustrating that usually tends to lead to worse outcomes ranging from uh, um, I believe there's some in like uh, negative affect I'm not sure if anyone has measured violence following that um i don't know all of the world's hot sauce tasks but uh yes frustration definitely leads to negative psychological outcomes what we don't know however is how long these outcomes last is it just the case that you're frustrated you throw the controller away and you're angry for five minutes or 12 years later what happens we don't know we should find out <laughs> but uh, yeah, frustration is one of these important factors for sure. And that's, you know, a lot of time from designer's side goes on trying to put tutorials in and stuff. So it's not frustrating. We can talk later. I'll just, yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, it sadly looks like we're uh, reaching quite close. Uh, does anyone have a really short question that they can still ask? Okay, really short. Go for it. <laughs> it can be answered quickly, I guess. <laughs> okay, so this is for Ari. Uh, um, I, w I wanted to ask, because you talked about how uh, particular fan game, uh, fans of games tend to do a lot of things that are like essentially free labor, but they don't perceive it as such. And it made me think of how it's similar in like within development teams. There's a huge thing of crunch time, of people doing like essentially exploitation of passion in order to get free work or like are video games specifically in a unique position on this where they uniquely exploit this or is it like just because of our perspective focusing more on games yeah, i'm not an uh, I'll, I'll try to answer fast now i feel the pressure um i'm not uh, uh, an expert in all entertainment industries but from what i've heard and from what i've read and uh, I, th I think shortly yes uh, it's uh, everywhere in the entertainment industry not just in video games but you can also see that in movies the recording industry even uh, even books for example and uh, make no mistake i have no issues with uh, video game designers themselves i i believe uh, there are people who uh, really enjoy uh, the love they get from fans and uh, when they say to fans that they love them i believe they believe it uh but um, when you hear that from uh, the marketing team or the sales team or uh, people who are not uh, really uh gamers themselves and they don't uh, know the gaming culture the uh, same way that the game developer game designer game artist would know it i believe that sometimes they say that they love you might be true but i think they love your wallet more All right. Well, thank you very much. That was a very informative or informative Q and A. Uh, just in general, as a host, I would like to say thank you to everyone. First of all, thank you to the audience for being so interactive. It definitely made everything, and especially this Q and A session here, really fun. Also, to see the back and forth between you guys and the audience. Then, of course, a huge thank you to you guys with your really awesome presentations and your speakers. And with that, I would like to also call all the organizers. Uh, of this to the stage really quick so that we can give everyone a more official thank you for that as well.